Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Stanley. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Edith Hanuka. Um, she has recently received her PhD on the influence of the EU on the nation state, the European Parliament as an allegory. Uh, this is a very well and comprehensive, well researched and uh, comprehensive work. I can say this because I've read it. Um, that really does a rather um, complex analysis of how the European institution, the European Parliament, has developed and how it interacts with the parliaments of the various nation states. Uh, she has written that uh, PhD at the Hebrew University at the History Department. Uh, she has, however, been following the institutional history of the EU for several years before starting the PhD because she has uh, written a master's thesis on the history of the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hanuka's interest in institutional history, and more specifically in the representative democracy and parliamentary history, stems from her professional work as a senior coordinator in a, the Economic Affairs Committee of the Knesset. Please, Dr. Hanuka. Uh, thank you, Professor Brunner, and good afternoon. Um, I mean to tackle multiculturalism from an institutional angle by focusing on the feasibility of representative democracy in the EU. The EU is undoubtedly not a state. Even though the founders of the European integration pr uh, process envisioned a United States of Europe, 62 years in a few days after the Schuman Declaration, we can say that the EU is not a federation of states. Nevertheless, the EU is not an international organization as well. Rather, it is more commonly described as a sui generis, a unique entity unlike any other political entity, past and present. I propose three reasons that make this entity unique. And make it necessary to evaluate it according to democratic principles. And by that, I uh, follow um, Ambassador Stanley's um, last point. Uh, the first most significant reason is its supranational features. These features are manifested in the institutional structure of the European Union, which includes institutions such as the European Commission, European Parliament, and the European Court of, Court of Justice, uh, these supranational institutions are acting according to European interests as uh, opposed to the sum of national ones. And uh, they have uh, capabilities which entitle them to take binding decisions with direct application on private individuals in the member states. The second reason is that the main intergovernmental institution, the Council of Ministers, which represents the interests of the states, takes much, much of its decisions under qualified majority. Now, this is much uh, harder majority to reach than regular majority, but it still means that member states that were in minority when a decision was taken have to comply with this decision. Last but not least, the third reason that the EU should be considered unique is the scope of policy administered by, by it, and which is unmatched by any other regional or international organization. Reviewing the policy dimensions of the EU, uh, it is possible to see that almost every aspect of European citizens' life is affected by, this, uh, by its decision making. Maybe two, uh, two aspects are less affected, and that's fiscal and, uh, and social policy, but even them, as we see today, are not such immune. For these reasons, I found it significant to question the ability of European citizens to influence the formulation of policy that affect their lives and taken by their representatives. I evaluated the feasibility of, democra of representative democracy in the European political system according to three parameters set in Abraham Lincoln's idiom in his Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. After careful examination of these characteristics of the characteristics of a political system of the EU, and in particular of the European Parliament. And after analyzing the effects of the European integration process on the, on the national parliaments, um, I, can say f I can say, sadly, that uh, I, I support the idea that, uh, that the EU suffers from a democratic deficit. Out of the three parameters 
the democracy in the EU is based mainly on government for the people, a parameter manifested by technocratic, not elected institutions, such as the Commission, uh, which are very effectively decision-making, but are not representative, and therefore less responsive to the public. In the other two parameters, I found intrinsic failures, mainly in their implementation. Government by the people in a representative democracy structure is expressed through representative institutions, and by that I mean parliamentary institutions. The European integration has fundamentally undermined the ability of national parliaments to represent their voters. In order to compensate for, uh, for this gap in democratic representation, for decades it has been the goal of supporters of European integration to expand the powers of the European Parliament. Being the sole e institution in the EU that is directly elected. As a result, the European Parliament today is an exceptional experiment in transnational democracy. And it is, its gradual expansion has led to tremendous deepening of supranational features of the EU. But a representation does require some kind of kinship between the representatives and the people that they represent. The main failure of the European Parliament's ability to perform its most important role, representing the people of the European Union, and um, having an arena for discussion of political ideas regarding European policy, is this lack in kinship. Also, the, the fact that the European uh, Parliament members are elected under national platforms uh, and nat national considerations and in national parties is another effect compounding this lack of kinship. Lastly, the failure of the third more problematic parameter, government for the people, stems from the most basic question, a question that overshadows the, all the three parameters. Who is the people? A system which operates according to democratic principle of majority vote, not only for the reasons I stated here, but also for the statement of the member states in the Lisbon Treaty, just lately, requires a certain amount of solidarity between, between its component parts. This is much, there is much scholarly debate on the existence of common European identity. There are main two sides for this debate. On the one hand, there are those that contend that political identity should be based on common cultural traits, such as common language, heritage, etc. According to scholars such as Smith and Grimm, who support this view, the multiculturalism in Europe prevents the formation of common European identity. On the other hand, there are these views that pronounced most vocally by Habermas that there is no necessity to link between political identity and cultural one. According to this view, a political European identity can be based on a constitutional patriotism, a commitment to liberal ideals, a democratic political system, and other values expressed in the social charter. After consideration of the different views, as well as public views expressed in Eurobarometer questionnaires, in my opinion, it is possible to say that a certain kind of European identity exists. However, this common identity is very fragile. <coughs> Using Habermas's idiom, I think it would be more accurate to base, um, more accurate to name the emerging European identity patriotism of quality of life, as it is based on the advantages of political and economic cooperation manifested in people's everyday life. A European citizen asked what he gains from the integration process does not immediately recognize these advantages, but common infrastructures, the ability to move freely, the competition, and yes, the common currency, even though it is in current crisis, all these and more serve as examples to the realization of European integration in everyday life. A realization that the people may not completely be aware of, but they are accustomed to it, and they enjoy the comfort and quality of life it provides them. Nevertheless, the path to a European demos, which characterizes solidarity and trust between its component parts, has a long way to go.
the emerging European identity is not capable of setting fire in the hearts and minds of the European people. It is not capable to mobilize them into political action and to make them willing to sacrifice for others. Rational considerations of economic and social benefit or of comfortable life are unable to overcome these emotional, the emotional power of national identity. If anything, the troubled times we are witnessing in Europe today serve as alarming proof of that. The question who is the people is at the heart of the democratic deficit in the EU. It seems that the motto of multicultural Europe, united in diversity, may very well be the thorn in the side of the EU's democratic legitimacy. Thank you.